lot of molecular changes are happening that affects the diagnosis or helps us to know the diagnosis, prognosis and uh, precision medicine, which is targeted therapy and salivary gland uh, tumors are having a lot of those things. And I thought uh, I will just uh, highlight the recent advances in salivary gland tumors. So I just divided my talk for the first uh, 45 minutes into six compartments. Let us start with the clinical and radiological features and applied histology. Histology is very, very important. You will be seeing why it is important. Uh, let us visit the WHO classification of uh, salivary gland tumors. And uh, the latest WHO is, uh, even though I'm saying latest, it is 2017, fourth edition. So fifth edition should be out within a couple of months. And uh, let us see what are all the updates from the previous WHO. And I want to take major part of my discussion on pattern analysis of uh, salivary gland tumors. And we have to do the pattern analysis by architecture and cell type. Uh, let us also see the molecular changes where the recent advances are happening. Uh, and what are the surrogate IHC markers? And more importantly, uh, I used to tell, we are uh, trying to help the surgeons and the oncologists, medical and surgical oncologists to treat the diseases. And uh, we should know what they're expecting. And uh, we should follow some guidelines like NCCN guidelines. I know how many, many of you may be using it, but I want to stress the application of pathology in the practical aspect in the treatment of the patient. And finally, let us finish with uh, take home messages and references. So let us start with the references. And these are the six references I want to give. Number one uh, by Lester D. R. Thompson. Uh, see, we used to have a mentor in pathology, but single mentor is not uh, enough now because pathology is growing and every system you have to keep yourself updated. So I used to have mentors for each system. And for the head and neck pathology, my mentor is Lester D. R. Thompson. I want to thank uh, Dr. Thompson for uh, his uh, sense of humor is uh, great. And in the pathcast, he has a video on, uh, is it a question? If you put the question mark, it's like a question. Who keeps changing the names of salivary gland tumors? Okay. But when you put it as an exclamatory mark, it is the answer. WHO keeps changing the names of the salivary gland tumors. It's a beautiful talk. I kindly request all of you to go and uh, listen to Lester D. R. Thompson. And I take again this opportunity to thank him for uh, keeping me updated in salivary gland tumors. The second reference is salivary gland tumors. Again, update on the latest WHO classification from diagnostic histopathology 26.4. Third is practical immunohistochemistry in the classification of salivary gland tumors. This is the latest one from uh, seminars in diagnostic pathology. And I think it's in February issue this month. And uh, fourth one is the NCC and guidelines. Remember the head and neck version uh, 2.2.2020. Uh, 2, it's like Endiran.2 version 2. Okay. It's again in July 2020. And the fifth uh, reference is molecular pathology of salivary gland neoplasms, diagnostic, prognostic, and the predictive perspective. This is very essential. Whenever you know some, a lot of molecular changes are happening. But in which field it will help in pathology? Is it for diagnosis? Is it for prognosis? Or is it for predictive uh, targeted therapy? That is very important. Understanding of that is very important. And uh, this is from uh, March 2021, Advances in Anatomic Pathology. And lastly, but not leastly, I kept the WHO fourth edition 2017 as the background. Uh, to get the details from that and then updated with all these references. So these are the six references. And I thought uh, I have to put some stickers for you to take uh, snapshots. So you see this uh, spiky person, that means you take a snapshot of that uh, screen. It will help you in future for you to, if you are interested, you can visit these areas. Great, let us go to part one, clinical radiological and applied histology. 
as you all know salivary glands we have three pairs of major salivary glands and other minor salivary glands and the function of the salivary gland uh, you just uh, start spitting the saliva out don't swallow it then you will know the importance of the saliva in moisturizing and dissolving the food in the digestion of the starch and more importantly in controlling the bacterial content of the oral cavity this clinical information gives you a lot of uh, information in the uh, major and minor salivary gland 70% of the neoplasm happens in the parotid and uh, only 30% happens in the other glands that's point number 1 point number 2 in the parotid 70% of the time we get pleomorphic adenoma okay only 30% of the time we get other tumors so parotid is the number one gland with the most of the tumor and pleomorphic adenoma is the most common but when you take the minor salivary glands 40% of them are only pleomorphic adenoma from 70 in parotid it's only 40 in minor salivary gland all the other malignancies for example mucopidermoid carcinoma takes 20% adenoid cystic another 20% polymorphous uh, adenocarcinoma takes 10% and other malignancies take 10% so the take home message here is smaller the gland more the malignancy the incidence of uh, salivary gland uh, malignant salivary gland is more in minor salivary glands rather than in major salivary glands that you have to remember and i think we have to take a snapshot of this location again major and minor salivary gland some tumors see anything can happen anywhere but some things are more common for example canalicular adenoma always happens in the upper lip i know we should not say always and never but for teaching purpose i want to see never try to diagnose uh, canalicular adenoma in the major salivary glands it may happen but most commonly in the minor salivary gland ductal papilloma cyst adenoma cyst adenocarcinoma polymorphous adenocarcinoma classic now known as polymorphic adenocarcinoma or cribri form uh, low grade adenocarcinoma of minor salivary glands okay these are all the new terminologies we will be explaining more in the who classification they happens in the minor salivary gland so location is very very important you take the uh, snap of this because you keep this when you are coming for differential diagnosis see whether it is in major salivary gland and minor salivary gland and then go through this list benign or malignant that is the very important question we have to answer to help us to answer that question we have to see what is the duration of the tumor longer the duration more benign rate of growth rapid the growth it's malignant border and this picture tells you about the border the border is very smooth or bosselated nodular you may see some non invasive nodules outside a well circumscribed lesion these are all characteristic of uh, benign whereas in malignancy the border will become irregular okay so i used to see take your hand close your fingers you see the fist it is benign but you extend the fingers you see the fingers it is infiltrating okay so they are all infiltrating and i hope this picture uh, worth uh, more money because this tells you the main difference between the benign and malignant salivary gland tumors in the borders and then cytological atypia but cytological atypia is a very big uh, question mark helpful in salivary gland but unfortunately cytological atypia doesn't play a major role in salivary gland it does have a role for example salivary duct carcinoma it will be more pleomorphic poorly differentiated uh, mucopidermoid carcinoma it's pleomorphic but when comes to small blue cell tumors atypia and mitosis they are not very helpful in salivary gland tumors one fnac second one core biopsy or incisional biopsy or excision or radical surgery with the lymph node these are all the five specimens we get in our department and fnac and core biopsy may be radiologically guided or non guided and whenever it is guided madam mentioned it we have to do a rose rose is nothing but a, a rapid on site evaluation and uh, the main role of rose is to see adequacy they have done a core biopsy or fnac you put it on the slide see ra- do a rapid staining and see under the microscope and see whether we have adequate material for diagnosis it is not necessary to tell the diagnosis at that point 
but I know the patients and radiologists will be pushing you. Is it benign or malignant? If it is 100% malignant, you commit yourself. Otherwise, you just tell them, I have adequate material for diagnosis. Let us wait for 12 hours. So, and then triage. Triage is also very important. For example, it is a lymphoid rich lesion. You are thinking of lymphoma. You have to send it for flow cytometry. If you think there are a lot of neutrophils and it look like abscess, then send it for microbiology. Uh, so adequacy and triage is the main uh, indicator, main help by doing the rows. Radiology, radiology and radiology, I want to stress more and more. And I want to give us an example of this case uh, where radiology will be helpful. It's a 42 year old female with the right parotid lesion. They did a core biopsy. And by the way, salivary gland tumors are very common in females. And the only very few tumors are very common in males. And Vardin tumor is one of the tumors that is common in male. So this core biopsy showed this, okay, only fibrous tissue, some uh, lymphocytes, some minor portion of the uh, salivary gland I can see. I don't see any tumor. So I called the clinicians and I told uh, there is no tumor. And then clinician asked me to come and check the radiology and see this, how destructive. And I'm ashamed to call this as tumor because this is a very big, even it is invading the eyeball. Okay, destroying the sinuses, and extending in all the directions wherever it can extend. So after seeing this radiology, no way this may be tumor. And whenever there is a radiological and histological discordance, you have to think of sampling error and interpretation error. Sampling error, probably they might have done biopsy from the peripheral, but with this big tumor, it is very unlikely. So the best thing for histology is go for deepers. And I did some deepers, get some more salivary gland, some more lymphoid tissue, and another deeper, you can very nicely see the, the core biopsy, adenoid cystic carcinoma, okay? So um, in uh, real life, uh, it's very, very important to correlate with uh, radiology, okay? And just don't see the radiology report. Any problem cases, you take the clinician, go to the radiology department, sit there, pull the radiology, and then check. People used to say, especially in bone and soft tissue, you must know the radiological features, but I slightly disagree with those people because radiology is another expanding area. It's very difficult to keep updated. I find it even in pathology, so many things are going in so going up in so many organs. It's very difficult, and uh, I can't update the my radiology knowledge. So what I do, I select my cases and go to radiology, sit with them. Okay, and uh, please believe me. The minute I sit with the clinicians and radiologists, life is uh, adventurous and fun, and they love it. Clinicians, and uh, you have to remember. Another uh, philosophical thought, patient is our boss, okay? So you have to keep your boss happy and uh, no egos. You should have a very close uh, relationship with radiologists and uh, clinicians. So radiology, radiology and radiology and radiology is part of pathology. It is gross pathology, okay? So that you have to remember, without radiology, never sign out any difficult cases. All the cases, especially the difficult cases, you have to take radiology for the diagnosis. And please remember, radiology is part of gross pathology. And in radiology, we have a lot of technologies, uh, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and uh, the new kit in the block is uh, PET. Uh, positive emission tomography and I love this pet because it shows activity and uh, in difficult cases where they fail to get material in the one or first or second attempt I ask them to do pet and I ask them to guide the biopsy from the pet guided uh, pet positive area whenever possible go for core biopsy because FNAC is very good but it has, has its own advantage and disadvantage and uh, the whole world is moving towards uh, core biopsy. And when you have the core biopsy, you have to individually take the core and put it in the paraffin block. When you get a lot of material like this, you select the core, okay? Take the major cores and separate them in the uh, 
uh, core biopsies. Remember, these are all needle biopsies. And when you put everything together, they become a noodle biopsy. And you, miss, you may miss the tumors when you put everything uh, together. And this shows you what are all the uh, possibilities where you can miss the tumor. For example, the light uh, gray one is the core biopsy and black is the tumor. If you put a single core and if you uh, embed it, embedding is very, very important in core biopsies again. And when you embed it uh, very nicely in a single plane, then your chances of getting tumor is very high. Okay, But when you embed very irregularly and sometimes in the superficial trimming, you may lose uh, the tumor or if you embedded the thing uh, tumor in the paraffin block, you may not cut it in the initial sections. This is what happened in the example case which I showed. Initially, there is only non-tumors, but after radiology, we went to deepers and we got the tumors. And the problem in putting multiple cores in one block they all uh, curl up, okay? And uh, that I love this terminology, noodle biopsy. Chances of missing the tumor is very high when you put uh, multiple cores in one block. That's about the clinical features. We will go to uh, histology. Salivary gland, histology is very important to understand the tumors of salivary gland. And here you can see the salivary gland uh, tissue and uh, the, these are all the functioning uh, lobules. The functioning lobules are arranged uh, in a zigzag pattern, okay? And it will have connective tissue in between the lobules. The lobules are predominantly made up of acini. We will see it in high power. And uh, the acini gets drained by the ducts and the major ducts are situated in the connective tissue. So remember 